Hello and welcome to another edition of The Change Exchange, where today we have a really, really special guest, Vota Kalaman. I'm so glad to have met you, to have met your music, because it was a gap in my education, I must admit that. Mm, thanks. Wonderful to thanks. share it. Thanks, Ruda. It's great to be here. Let's start with the beginning. You were 10 years old, um, I read somewhere, and yeah. your parents took you to a concert and That's said, if you were to play an instrument, which one would it be? Yes. And you said? The flute, because actually I was looking at the clarinet, but my brother chose the clarinet first, and so I didn't have that option. But uh, I like the idea of expressing myself using my breath, you know, like in talking or singing. Um, because I, I just think that's so natural and so expressive. So, um, but, and I saw that the flute points to the side while everything else points to the front. So I thought that must be a special instrument. <laughs> <laughs> so my, from else. Yes, it's so on my 10 year old thinking. That's what I decided to go for. And I'm really th grateful for that because the, the flute's such an expressive instrument um, and it can do so many things. We have extended techniques on the flute. So you can play the, the, a beautiful classical melody, you can uh, put a bit of breath in it and, and have this jazzy influence, or you can do some, something more funky, or you can use the, the, the sounds of the pads, you can sing while you play, you can beatbox while you play, we call it flute boxing. So I like to use all those, all those sounds uh, while expressing myself making music. Tell me about your very first flute. Yes. Um, uh, you know, I um, was I couldn't wait to start, and my my parents rented a flute, and um, then my the teacher was sick, so I couldn't have my first lesson, and my parents wouldn't allow me wouldn't allow me to put the flute together because we don't even know how to put it together, and they were scared I'm going to break it. So so every day I would just open it and look at it <laughs> <laughs> for for a week every day. I'd just open it and look at it, and, and then. Can, can you remember holding it for the first time? Yeah, I was so excited when my teacher showed me, and then I went straight back home after my first lesson and played for like two hours. And then after that, I just fell in love with it. You know, I was wondering afterwards whether the sort of um, looking at the flute for a long time and waiting for it uh, was instrumental in, in, in my enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. You know, that might be a good teaching technique. <laughs> Why did you go and study engineering then? Because it sounds as if music was the thing, yeah, always. It was. Um, I always, I did love maths. That's my two talents are music and maths. Yeah, they often and say that they go together. They right? say so, yeah. So in my case, I did love maths and um, I loved puzzles, um, you know, figuring things out. Um, but music was my first love. But when I left school, I wanted to go and study music, but we didn't have money to go and study. Um, but I could get a bursary to study engineering. So um, I decided to study engineering because that was my only option, uh, or not go to university. Um, and I enjoyed studying engineering as well, and I just kept on playing the flute. I thought, well, I'll study engineering, and I'll just keep on playing the flute. And, um, and that's what I did. I, I was very active playing every day. You couldn't have had much free time because engineering is it a was, full time job. It was very strenuous. Yeah. It was very strenuous, but um, engineering was quite easy for me. Um, so I didn't, I didn't do that much studying. <laughs> <laughs> I did quite a bit of partying as well. <laughs> so I managed to find lots of time um, to play. Um, I also enjoyed table tennis and tennis. So I played, I started the university's table tennis club. And um, so, you know, I was, just, I was very busy and enjoying all aspects, you know, and I think those things rub off on each other. You know, I think doing engineering has helped me in my music career, and I think playing sports makes you more um, coherent uh, being, and, um, you know, I think that's also helped my musical career. How so did engineering uh, help or support the music? Well, think? much later than... Uh, the business sense and the logical, because these days in the music industry, you can't just be a musician. Um, you have to, you, you're a business person looking after your music business. And that's more than 50% of the job. So you actually need those business skills and logical thinking skills. 
So you, you had your own engineering company at one point? Yes, I, I, I had to go and work back uh, my bursary in Whitbank on the coal mines in that center of creative activity. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't enjoy Whitbank very much at the time because there was, there was not even one movie theater. <laughs> so um, so I, I was really wanted to get away from, from Whitbank. So I, I started my own engineering business as soon as I could. Because also, you know, working on the mines, uh, you know, I left home at five, the, the bus would pick, pick me up and I was a, a training, a engineering training. I'd spend the whole day underground and then come back tired. Not, and by then I'd started a young family and I just didn't have time to play the flute. So I started to, I thought, let me start my own company. Uh, and that will allow me to have more control over my time. And um, so that's what I did. So that, you know, that was a big decision one that I agonized over because it was quite risky. Uh, but I managed to get a contract, um, you know, and for a while I, I, worked, I, I worked at the um, in a military band as well. Uh, and that was sort of the transition. I earned money both in the military band and um, running my own company. And that allowed me. So for a person, when you start that, uh, that entrepreneurial enterprise, yeah. build a bridge. That's yeah. That's what I did. So I had um, half day steady income, oh. which was which covered all my costs. Uh, but I did I did um, leave the engineering before I finished my bursary, paying back my bursary. So I had a lot of money to pay back. Mm. And um, at that stage, I decided why I, I really wanted to go and study the flute overseas. So I thought, let me make a quick fortune. <laughs> I just want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so while I started my engineering business, I thought, well, I'm going to invest on the stock market. And, and I asked my uncle, who was an expert on the stock market. He had done very well up to that stage. Oh, dear. And <laughs> Where is this going? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I asked him for advice. I went to all the banks I could. And being a graduate and an engineer, um, I could get significant of, um, amount of loans and I invested it all in the stock exchange but my timing was dreadfully wrong because I, uh, that was three months before Black Monday oh. <laughs> you know in, in, in 87 in October 87 the, the markets crashed and I, lo I lost 90 percent 90 percent of what I had loaned how did you come back and then after that uh, the interest rates went up to 23 percent so I had to pay back all that money at that huge interest rate and uh, I, just wor I just really worked very hard and um, rented a house. We, we stayed, me and my family, my, my wife and my kids stayed in the lounge. We rented out all the, all the rooms in the house <laughs> so because we couldn't afford rent and um, so it was a really tough period. You know, she then. couldn't have been impressed. <laughs> no, she, she wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't either. I was very um, but, um, you know, we managed and it took me about four years of very hard work to pay back all the money. I didn't want to go bank, declare myself bankrupt because I, I just thought it was unethical if I could possibly mm. make back, earn back the money. Uh, it would have been an easier way to just de declare myself bankrupt and make a fresh start and walk but, away. And walk away. But I, d I didn't want to do that because I just felt I was able to pay it back, you know, even though it was going to be kill myself to do it for, for many years. But I managed to, to do it and then soon after that my engineering business started to prosper and uh, I took summers off, the European summers or, uh, or American summers and traveled overseas to have master classes with the world's best teachers. It didn't cost quite as much in RAND terms as it would now. <laughs> exactly. The RAND was so much stronger then. The RAND was I think three to one. So you kept your Enthusiasm, enthusiasm for the for the music. You kept that alive. Because yes, I think all that the time. Kind of debt can sometimes wear you down, so that you can see nothing else. Yeah, for a while I had to practice very little. I I put the milk on the stove for my breakfast cereal, pick up the flute, and as soon as the milk's hot, <laughs> that's it. That's my flute playing for the day. <laughs> <laughs> but I never stopped, uh. even those three minutes, and that that's what I would say is my speciality is inching forward. 
you know, that I'm very good at that. It takes a long time, but you just make a little bit, and I don't know you're talking about big changes, but I, I believe the most powerful uh, tool for me is making small changes. And, and that's what kept me going. Those three minutes a day of flute playing kept me going and stopped me from like starting over and, mm. you know, and just keep it going. And in my mind as well, you know, because you dream about it. If you do something, you dream about it at night and, and it grows, you know. So it's not just those three minutes that you do, you know. No, it affects yeah. the rest of the day. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about creating your first album, Colors. It took a number of years. Yes, it took a long time because um, from the engineering, I wanted to, after a few years of doing engineering, I decided, let me do this change over to, to a full-time musician. And I just went all out and ran out of money after nine months. <laughs> and I had to go back to engineering. And then after another four years, I did the same thing again, ran out of money again, went back to engineering for many years. And because, you know, having a small family, um, my first priority was with the kids. Mm. So I wanted to look after them properly, and they were expensive to look after. So, um, you know, that, that, and I didn't want to travel as well. I didn't want to mm. be, be away, away. from, be mm. away from home. Um, so that limited my musical, you know, um, scope of what I could do to earn money. And then finally I made that transition uh, when my, my son left school, so it took 20 years, you know. Um, my son left school, my daughter just finished university. I paid off my house, I paid off for this, I paid their studies, and I tried to make, and this time it was more possible to make that transition. So I then set about to finally follow my, my passion and spent years making this first album, uh, you know, and I think the first album often is, is a really good album because it's actually not just the few years, it's, it's a lifetime of musical experiences that you put into one album. So I put everything into that album. And, yeah. What struck me when I listened to part of it is you're an Afrikaans boy from Linden, yeah. but there are so many other influences in it. How did that come about? Well, yes, when, when I was a young boy, uh, there was only classical music. I think in our, in our house there's only classical music except for a Miriam Makeba album, which I loved. Uh, but when my mom uh, went to work, she worked half days, the lady who looked after me played only African music. And so I was really under, the, I loved it, I loved that, you know, the, the beat and, and the groove. And um, so that stayed with me and, and that sort of became a cur curiosity. I'm very curious about all kinds of different cultures. And I'm enamored by, by roots music from all over the world. You know, music that's been, that survived centuries and that's been passed on from generation to generation. And that influence has something really special. So, you know, I do love classical music. That's what I played most, most of my life. Um, but I've got all these other interests. So when How I, did you make the connections with the, with the musicians that you involved? Um, well, you know, when I started making my, my first album, I found um, Maritz Lotz, who's a guitarist producer, so he helped me produce, but I, at that stage I was sponsoring an African dance class, um, um, and I would, um, it was at the Brixton Recreation Center, and I paid, I made sure that David Matamela, a dancer, was teaching there every day. He was the guy who choreographed African Footprint. And I would go to that African dance class every morning and stand in the back of the class and try and learn some steps and get into the vibe. And, um, and then I met some dancers there um, that weren't musicians, but they were actually great natural musicians. So we, we started jamming and I invited them to my house. We started making some music. And um, I was also at that stage um, doing getting into yoga, and uh, my guitarist and my yoga teacher is the same person. And uh, neither of us had ever improvised anything. We were both classically based. And we thought, well, why don't we try together to improvise something? Because we're both so clueless that we won't be embarrassed. 
you know, because I think that's for a classical musician, that's the biggest thing is, is you try something that sounds really bad and you're so embarrassed that you can't do this that you don't want to do it again. <laughs> so we were so comfortable with each other. Um, that Go to YouTube and Google Duel. Is that, yeah. Did that flow that's, out of that? Yeah, yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, yes, so we started just improvising, and most of it was really bad. Uh, but every now and then, we'd hit a sweet spot where something sounded pretty good. So we would just record it that little bit, carry on, carry on, until we hit another sweet spot. And we recorded that, and eventually put those sweet spots together, and that became a song. And that's how easy it was for us. Um, and that became most of that, um, that first album. There's such a lovely element of playfulness yeah. in all of this, that it sounds as if it wasn't really hard work and we were doing this thing, but you were also just enjoying it. Yes, we were just playing, experimenting, venturing into the unknown for us, for unknown world. We d I didn't do a course in impro improvisation, or so I think what we did was kind of fresh, uh, because it was just, it was, we didn't fo follow any formula or we weren't taught how to improvise. So we didn't realize it at the time, but those songs, and I repeated some of those songs um, in the different versions later on, and some of those songs that we just started with, like my first song I ever wrote, found its way on Winds of Samsara, which won the Grammy. So we actually had quite a magical period there that we didn't know, we didn't realize magic was happening and we just felt like we were just playing around and experimenting. What was it like to hold it in your hand and here's your first, your first did, did, was it still a CD then or did yeah, it just yeah. exist digitally? <laughs> no, it was, it was a CD. I was very proud of it. When, when we finished it, I still wasn't happy and I wanted to have it mixed by the best person in the world. So I, I, I sort of thought, who is the best person in the world that I would like this to mix? And then at that stage, uh, Nora Jones's big album uh, had just won eight Grammys, and I fell asleep to that music every day. And I looked, and I said, well, who mixed this? And uh, it, was, it was an LA-based musician, um, engineer, Husky Hoskels, from basically, he's, he, he's, he's an Icelander who lived in, and so I sent him the album, thought, he probably gets so many requests uh, that he probably won't even, he will file 30 in it. But I got an email back saying, I love the music, I, I love the experimental nature, I like the freshness. Oh, that must have been It was amazing, amazing yeah. it was amazing. And he said, it's already so well mixed, you actually don't need anybody to mix it. Hmm. So I said, no, I want you to mix it. <laughs> so he agreed. I went over to LA, worked with him, and... Some of the, the songs, we couldn't get a better result than what we had. But the songs that I wasn't happy with, we could. And that says a lot about South African musical standards. And South African musical standards are really amazing. That's what I discovered over the years. Dealing, you know, um, I'm a Grammy voting member, and I get sent a lot of um, albums to vote on. And I think South Africa is absolutely world class. People don't realize it. You know, we, here we've got this tendency to say, well, this is just us. Mm. But we really have world-class musicians, world-class music, um, but we don't do enough business-wise to, to, to get it heard. You know? um, but yeah, so we, we finished that album, and um, once finished, I sent it to the big major labels, and expecting them, because it was, I thought it was an amazing album, uh, expecting them to fall over their, their feet you know, to release this album, and none of them would even listen to it. There was one, there was one where we could get an appointment. The others just said, sorry. Uh, and the one we did get an appointment with, when we walked in there, he says, yeah, mm, you know, it's just nice, but it's not really our thing. And we saw that the CD was on his desk, still in its wrapping. So he hadn't listened to it. So nobody would even listen to it. Because they go, uh, we don't, Flute album, no. Mm. And I was already in my 40s, so I was, it was a difficult time because I'm thinking, nobody seems to be wanting to hear a flute album. I've lost my, lost all my, uh, you know, my youthful sex appeal that could have helped. <laughs> 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 so, 
So, um, you know, so then we took it to the independent record labels. They also weren't interested. We eventually found someone who came that, and we could sort of combine and self-release. And, uh, and how did it sell? It actually sold pretty well, you know. Um, um, it, it, it got fantastic reviews. You know, I still remember in the Citizen, it was my album and then Santana's album. Santana's 8 out of 10, me, I'm 9 <laughs> out of 10. I saw. <laughs> <laughs> I still, uh, that was my first review. I was really grateful for, for that sure recognition. I'm sure you have that framed against the wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, and that, w that album was nominated for a Salma that year. So, you know, started, things started to happen. You know, people started to take notes. And then Samsara, with which you would go on to, to win the Grammy, how did the connection with Indian music come about? Well, you know, I, I used to uh, date a, a girl from India, um, and she introduced me, as well as Tulsi, my manager is Indian, uh, they introduced me to the Bollywood music and the Indian music, and it's just music that I had been listening to for a long time. So when I... My first two albums I entered for, for Grammys, and even though I thought they were great, they got absolutely no attention um, in the US. And I realized what you have to do is you have to go and tour there and do a lot of marketing on top of having a great, a great musical album. Yeah, because you have to have an awareness. Yeah, be, be, because people don't know it. There's a whole uh, huge amount of, of, of voting members, um, I think um, 20 um, 12,000 12, voting members, all musicians. That's how the Grammys work. You voted by your peers. Um, but if they, they, there's 22,000 entries every year around there. Sure. So, they, so they're not going to listen. listen to everything. No, you can't yeah. listen. So if, if, if you haven't done some touring, if, if there's not awareness, even if you have a great album, you're not going to get there. Mm. But part of the, one of the fringe benefits of being part of this whole Grammy uh, process was I, I was listening to a lot of other music. And other people were listening to my music, and Ricky Kej from Bangalore had just also entered his album uh, um, into the Grammy process. I had heard his music, he had heard my music, he sent me an email saying, oh, I, I really like your flute playing, would you like to add flute to this track? And he sent me this track that was mind-blowingly good, this, it just moved me. And I, and I thought, well, this guy I really have to impress, because he is amazing. So I spent a lot of time sending him something really nice back, and he loved it. And then we started talking about South Africa and India, and uh, Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, and we realized that Mahatma Gandhi spent 20 years of his life mm -hmm. in South Africa, and that he started his concepts of peaceful resistance over here, and Mandela was very influenced by that. Mm -hmm. So we had that conversation, and started, then I wrote a song for, for, for Madiba, he wrote a song for, my, for Mahatma Gandhi, and we started working together, and when we looked again, we had an old album. And what was it like when they informed you that you'd won? Well, first it was the nomination. We didn't, you know, nomi my dream was to get a nomination. So one enters, and then there's a kind of shortlist, and that's the, those yeah. are the nomination. You enter, then there's a shortlist of, first there's a, a shortlist of about a few hundred, um, and then people vote, the whole and then they choose five. And to get to that, to so top five in the world, really, because the Grammy is really, it's a worldwide, really, it was just a dream that I'd never um, knew, you know, that, that could, could happen. So um, to get to that nomination, for me, that was the big thing. We, you know, and they, it was announced, and I was just uh, so grateful for that. And then we went to the Grammys, and um, our fellow nominees had... I think 36 previous nominations. <laughs> so this was our first nomination. And we didn't think we had a chance, but we were just grateful to be there. But we had done really well in sales. We were number one on the Billboard charts for the New Age category, which that album was. And uh, we were number one on the, on the radio charts. And um, because by then... In the US? In the US. By then we'd figured out, I was touring there. I played Carnegie Hall that year. Uh, I played at the Grammy Museum in LA. And... Um, we had been touring the States. It was a long, it was a long time coming. You know, we spent the previous six years getting started in the States, going over regularly, playing, finding out how things work over there, you know, um, 
we have to get, you know, you have to know the radio promoters and which ones will just rip you off and which one will actually give you some value and all those things. And we figured it out. So finally things came together. So you really put in the 10,000 hours. Uh, you worked yeah, it. Yeah, many, many, many more than 10,000. <laughs> and I think the, yeah. the underlying message almost is do not give up. Yeah. It's not no means next. Exactly. Uh, no, uh, do it. the next thing. Try the next thing. That's it. You know, we just kept on trying. I think many people feel more than think that it either happens or it doesn't. And if it yeah. doesn't happen, you forget about your dream and you walk away and you go and work in the pizza land or something. That's right. Yeah. But what I'm hearing you saying is it's graft. It's yeah. put one foot in front of the other and start again tomorrow morning and phone someone, the next person. Yeah, no, that's very much, that's what playing a musical instrument teaches you. And that's what I've, I've found, that playing a musical instrument has a profound effect on, on you. Because, you know, when you play the flute or any instrument, when you can't do something, you practice until you can do it. So when you can't do it, your, the way of thinking is, oh, well, I can't do it today, but I'm just patiently working at it. And, I'm, and then you see, oh, well, a week later, or a month later, or a year later, now I can do it. And that's such a big life lesson. Because in life, I found, even in my engineering company, I ended up employing musicians. Because they understood this. Uh, while many other people did not understand, they, they, they try something, they can't do it, they go, well, I can't do it. You know, and that's the end of it. So I think music teaches you, sport teaches you that as well. You know, because you, an athlete uh, breaks 12 mm -hmm. seconds for the 100 meters, and he can't go any better, and he practices, and then he breaks 11 seconds. And so it also teaches you to accept input from other people without seeing it as criticism. Yeah, I mean, if your big. sports um, trainer says you placing mm. your hand the wrong way, that's right. You don't feel, oh, he doesn't like me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and your teacher tells you things, and you and you look, you learn to look for how to do things. You know how how to do things well. You research it. You know you don't depend only on your teacher. You, you know, looking for other teachers, other advice, experimenting, and I think that's a really big life lesson. So now you have another entry in the uh, the, the Grammys for 2015, and you promised to play us something. Yes. Um, well, I actually entered uh, the the next album, Love Language, um, entered it last year, and this time it was in the contemporary instrumental category which is a more competitive category than the New Age because all instrumentalists in the world are up for it. So that's you know, all guitarists, all pianists, all sax players, all violin players, all going for that one award. Um, so when I, then we got to the top five. Um, so that was really... Uh, when was that announced? That was announced in December last year. And then we went to the Grammys again in February. But this time... Uh, I didn't. I didn't win it. Uh, this snarky puppy, uh, which is a great band, forty-piece band. They collaborated with um, the Metropole Orchestra, which is a Dutch, um, the, mo the the biggest professional orchestra in the world, and they had been nominated sixteen times before. So they were just uh, they were just too good, and they had a great album. And uh, so I was very happy to lose to them. I was just very happy to be mentioned in the same breath. And, and the, the song that you said you were going to play, you say there's a backstory to it. Yes, um, well, this is, this is um, uh, a song that I wrote for Madiba. It's called The Long Road, and it describes his life with the colors of the flute. So it starts off with him growing up in his rural Transkai, where he's very close to nature and spent some time herding cattle. Um, when I was writing the song, I was thinking about him sitting by his cattle, listening to the beautiful sounds of nature, which even then must have been tinged with a touch of sadness, showing what was to come in his life. And then in the next section, he moves to the city, and the peacefulness of nature makes space for the hustle and bustle of city life, and a train of events that would take control of his life. In this section, I use all kinds of extended techniques to show those, those moments. And in the last section, he retires, finally has time to be peaceful again and spend with his family. And the piece ends on an unfinished note, showing that even though his life is over, his memory and influence will carry on and sustain us far into the future. Will you play some for us, please? Of course. <laughs>
and the song is called uh, The Long Road. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> oh. Thank you. <laughs> so on a more personal note, you've talked about your children and uh, that they, they had a practical impact in your life. Yeah. But what about the emotional impact? How did they change you? Well, you know, things changed um, completely. Um, and I was very young at the time, but I was just so much... Un so under the in awe of this new life and beautiful beings uh, a daughter and a son and um, I just thought well that's my first priority and uh, you know, I have to look after them first before anything else and that's why I waited so long to follow my musical passions I still I still kept on while you know while they were growing up but I, I was a very involved dad I was the, the taxi mom, <laughs> driving them everywhere, spending lots of time with them. And, um, and yeah, so it was my priority to look after them and do the engineering as well to, to make that possible. Now they say adults don't make children, cha children make adults. <laughs> because yeah. you have to take that responsibility. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Are you still close? We're very close. We spend a lot of time, a lot of time together. And they my friends now. You know, because I was a young father, and, uh, and I go dancing often. I do salsa and bachata with my daughter. So we, we go out a lot, and we have dinners, a lot of dinners together. And uh, I have a granddaughter as well now, two-year-old Chai. She's the love of my life at the moment. Can you remember seeing her for the first time? Yes. I, I, she's just, you know, I, I was there with my two children's births, and I remember holding them. I remember holding little Chai as well. And uh, it's just such a magical moment, you know, when that happens. Yeah, yeah it looks yeah. as if one can't believe that we grew, all of us <laughs> grew out of, out of that. Yeah, so, yeah, so. it's just so special and just, just to see a child grow and to be part of it and just give them as much love. I was actually very inexperienced and a totally clueless parent. <laughs> and we didn't, like I'm, I'm watching my son and his wife now, how good they are and how they've researched everything and they have the internet you know and they and they know so much about every step of the development and 
they're so good with all the food and the oils and the vitamins, you know, all the fruits and the veggies and exactly, they know exactly what to do. And I was so clueless. And, but the one thing I had was a lot of love for, for the kids. And, and they, I, I thought my, my, my goal was to, I think, to teach any child two things are, in my view, very important. The one is how to be loving and uh, the other one is how to be responsible, you know, and not blame everything if things go wrong in the world and believe you're a, you're a victim of circumstance. So that kind of attitude, I, I think, is not healthy for anybody to have. So that was my two things I tried to teach them. Mm -hmm. And they're both very loving. Uh, and uh, my, and, and they, my son's very responsible because he's got a little baby. My, my daughter's a free spirit. <laughs> she... she um, um, but yeah, they, I'm still in awe, awe of them. <laughs> and at home, uh, you travel so much. What's the best thing about coming home? The people here. You know, the people here and the spirit. And um, people are, are extremely friendly and welcoming. I think South Africa is the only country in the world where the um, passport official smiles at you. <laughs> And says, hello, how are you? Yeah. I, I haven't actually seen that anywhere else in the world. And I've traveled many, many places. But it's a very serious process when you go through the, the passport. And you always feel a little bit uncomfortable moving. You're like, and are they going to allow me? Yes. But in South Africa, they smile. They're having a great time. <laughs> the passport officials are having the time of their life. It looks like it anyway. It's, you know, yeah. welcoming all these people. And I think that's a very South African, you know, beautifully South African thing. And your, your physical home, what's the best thing? What, what do you, when you look for a home, what do you look for? Light, space, trees? Yeah, I'm, for me, things have to be light. I get depressed if there's too much darkness. So even at night, I've got all the lights on, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, I, I designed my house in, in Randburg. Uh, at the time, uh, you know, I thought the, 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 the kids are going to go to the school just around the corner and I wanted to have a tennis court because I, I love playing tennis. So I, there was only one street that had enough space. So I put a little letter in every post box said, do you want to sell your house? <laughs> and uh, someone responded. I bought the house and um, designed a whole a lounge dining room area that, that doubles as a performance space. And a lot of light, a lot of windows and... Uh, place for a studio um, and uh, that kind of thing. So that's my home. Mm. And for me, light, sort of a friendly place, you know. Um, so that's, that's what I'm into. Yeah. And when you, how, many, how often have you moved? How well, long have you had that house? That are for a very long time oh. because I'm allergic to moving. Uh, I, I remember moving, I think, 17 times in five years or something at some stage. You know, with with all my my life changing so often, and uh, mm -hmm. since then I've really tried not to move at all. And that this is enough. And this is the one time when I where I draw the line. I love my friends, but I will not help them move. <laughs> 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 I've, I've just done it too many times. <laughs> yeah. Bertha, thank you so much for visiting and for that very special gift of your music. Oh, uh, thank you so much. All of the very very thanks, best. Thanks for having me. Until next time, good luck, enjoy life.